Oi, oi. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 460. That's cuatro seis zero. I think that's how you spell it in Spanish. Cuatro seis zero. Right? Uno, dos, cinco, seis, siete. Right? That's how you say it. Seis. Cuatro seis zero. How you doing, my friends? How you feeling? great amazing good to hear if it's your first time checking out the show you know what to do if you're watching the youtube and if you're listening via the podcast app please leave me a five-star review and share that with your family and friends that's all i ask of you please leave me a five-star review it'll take you no longer than five minutes to leave me a five-star review look how that rhymes and share the show with your friends and of course support via patreon is welcome too i've got a bunch of content up there that i'm planning to do i've already got a movie review there for a movie called husbands so if you're into that kind of thing please check out my patreon at patreon.com forward slash Agostino, you get a bonus show, you get reviews, you get loads of in-depth things only available to our Patreon subscribers, and you can subscribe for as little as one dollar, the equivalent of one pound per month on my Patreon at patreon.com for us A G O S T I N H O. And I'm committing to doing at least one bit of new content on there per week. Please hang in there with me and subscribe on Patreon. Greatly appreciate it if you can. Anyway, we're back, man. We're back. Hope you're good. Hope you're nice. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fired up, as you can tell. I've just been fasting for the past, what, 18 hours or so. I'm doing a little test with myself, a little challenge. You know those little videos you see on YouTube where people um, try and lose the, mo the most amount of weight they can in like 30 days, 40 days, 50 days? Well, I'm doing the same thing in the next 30 days, so I'm going to see how that goes. Essentially, I'm going to be fasting for 20 to 40. No. Well, I've been doing it for 50 I've been doing for about 55 days so far. So basically, I'm, I'm fasting uh, 20 hours and then eating within a four-hour window using the Zero app. So that's going pretty decently. I'm also working out six times per week, which means I'm doing weight training three times per week and then running cardio-wise three times per week, a minimum of three miles. I'm going to do the three miles from this week. Last week, I was doing loads of sprint relays, but I was seeing the weight wasn't really shifting too much because I was doing 200-meter repeats, which is good. Don't get me wrong, but it's not exactly the thing that you need to do when you want to actually you know um drastically improve your i guess your cardio and maybe maximize your weight loss i think those sprint relays are really good in terms of getting your overall um what would you say I guess giving your overall rhythm, right? Your cadence when you're running, making sure that your heels are flicking the back of your buttocks and stuff, making sure you're driving with the arms. All that stuff works really well when you're doing 200 meter repeats or any repeats of that like. But if you really want to improve your overall cardiovascular base, you just need to go on long, slow runs. You need to go on fast runs, but you just need to go and run above two mile mark. And that's the only way you're really going to get there. And I know for me personally, whenever I up the ante on the cardio, the weight goes whoosh. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So that's going to be really good. I'm already up. I, I'm doing a little vlog too on my on my iPhone. I'm taking clips every single day or every other day so far, and of course weighing myself into the, the week. So I have a nice little compilation I'm going to put together, and hopefully that'll be one of those videos I can put on my channel. Right? That'll be like on my YouTube channel. That'll be one of those like a million view ones. Like, oh my god, look at this guy transformation. I'll be sick because I've done it before anyway. I've done it plenty of times. Like I said, my weight kind of fluctuates up and down now i just want to keep it steady i've gone fat skinny skinny fat you just look look at the, some of my videos go back to the early 300s sometimes the high 200s you'll see how skinny i was then it picked up again it went down again they picked back up again so this is this is going a bit good but it's fine because now i'm doing a lot of weight training so i'm pa i'm packing on some good muscle here so once that weight comes off it'll be stripped off you'll see the delts and the shoulders come out i'll start popping out nicely but i'll still be um slivet enough to fit into some of my celine saint laurent my rick Owens and stuff, you know what I mean? That's what I want to do. This is good, right? Wearing these sort of like baggy Balenciaga pieces that Demma makes is flipping good. If you can't see it on the listen to the podcast, but I'm wearing um what what did they call this? Is it a C-shape? I think it was called a C-shape buffalo check. I don't know, whatever it is. It's like a tartan jacket made by Balenciaga, but it's a really baggy fit. So this is obviously, you know, makes you look a little bit more whoop, 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 whoop. And obviously, it's a bit more forgiving in terms of shape-wise, but some of the other stuff I have in my wardrobe is a little bit skin-tight. It's a little bit, you know, it kind of, you know, really uh, tucks in under the armpits. Yeah, the armhole. So you have to be a certain size, which is unfortunate, really, isn't it? You can't... And unfortunately, with, um, you know, mainstream fashion, you just can't be, like, dumbbells guy. You have to be kind of push-ups and pull-up dude. You can't do anything with a barber. If you really want to wear like actual fashion stuff, you can't do nothing with a barber. If you do, you have to be those guys that just goes in the gym and just does super, super high reps with a really, really low weight. And no one wants to do that if you're a guy. If you're a guy and, you know, a red-blooded male and you go to the gym, the last thing you want to do is be sitting in the gym 
and you know doing low weights really high reps while everyone else is around you is picking up massive bits of weights and stuff it shouldn't be a thing you shouldn't really be comparing your workouts to other people do it but unfortunately when you're in there something happens where you kind of want to push yourself as well which is it's less about comparison and also pushing yourself because you don't have a gym at home i'm assuming most people that do go to work out in normal gyms don't really have their own rack at home you just want to take advantage of having that space being able to slam stuff on the floor right you just want to take advantage of everything of, of the time that you have there so why would you go there and just do like weights that you could just probably get away of doing squats at home right if you could if you're doing really low if you're doing like a back squat in a gym with really low weights you're better off just doing you know you better off just bang a kettlebell and doing weighted what you call it squats that way right you, you're better off doing goblet squats sorry that way as opposed to going to the gym so that's sometimes there's a bit of a hard thing to swallow but I, i'm quite disciplined in what i do i really stick to my you know my program which is at the moment starting strength you know one of the best if not the best um weightlifting programs i've ever done in terms of just strength and overall power it's flipping amazing um so i've been using that mostly and that just that's a really um extraneous uh, program because it kind of breaks you mentally because there's so much squatting you squat basically every time you go to the gym so it's a combination of there's i think they split the workouts into group a and group b group a at the time that i'm on now i'm on like month one to month three i just borrowed i just got like a cheat sheet online i got the book as well but i don't really you know read that too much because i already read it once so the cheat sheet i just bought i just got it online so i made a little cheat sheet with all the workouts and basically got workout a workout b workout a is specifically like squats um, overhead presses and then one deadlift for five reps and then on the workout b is power cleans bench presses and deadlifts no bench presses deadlifts power cleans bench presses and squats again so you're always doing a squat no matter what you get away with it so you have to do like you know uh three sets of five and it's like oh every time you go into the gym it's like okay, here we go another squat and so because my ankles are super tight and i have to put like little plates underneath my heels to make sure my heels are on the floor because you know I, I don't have the best of uh, range of motion at the moment it's getting there but it's not where it kind of wants to be it kind of can get a bit difficult but you know what can you do man what can you do so that's going pretty well i'm really um liking that and it just it's good to just have that one singular pursuit in terms of like what you're trying to do like that can occupy your mind because then i found maybe it's just me but i found whenever i'm like bothered or whenever i'm like aiming for a goal whether it's like trying to run a 5k under 25 minutes or i'm trying to you know lose a bunch of weight it always kind of does away with all the other nonsense talk in my head with other things going on in culture don't really seem to bother you as much because you have so much things going on in your own life if that makes sense does that make sense to you um i think that's generally the thing whenever you see somebody complaining a lot online or talking a lot about what other people are doing and not doing um usually in my experience it's definitely a sign that that person isn't fulfilled in their own life and doesn't really have anything going on which is fine in it because i don't think i don't think that's that should be a good enough that, that that shouldn't be something to look down upon people with you know what i mean like i always say like on this podcast that like, it's really difficult to find like hobbies when you're an adult so if one of your hobbies is like minding other people's business then fair play to you in it um what you call it you know enjoy yourself do what you want but I think sometimes when it can get a little, gets a little bit, you know, a little bit OTT when they keep rabbing on and on and on and on and on. And I find especially some of the <clears throat> more cuckoo Hollywood types who I'm going to mention a couple later on. Um, a lot of those people, especially when it comes to women, they could probably be best served if they've concentrated or focused their time on improving every aspect of their actual life, whether it was relationships, health, fitness, um, you know, personal style, musical taste, film taste, whatever it may be, right? All those things could be would could be um those were far those those could be a far better avenues to pursue than actually bothering yourself with what the Kardashians are getting upset with or whatever is going on now. Because now, the moment, what's the story now? I read something about people are getting upset because Kendall Jenner's new tequila brand, she made an advert where people are saying she's culturally appropriate because she dressed up like poker hunters or something. I don't know. Like, who, who gives a fuck, right? It really shouldn't bother you, right? These th This family have basically told us what they're about, you know, from their inception. Why should it be a surprise that they're going to try and, you know, um, appropriate a culture that they have no relation to in order to kind of further their ability to make more money and under the premise of like, oh, I love this thing. It shouldn't be that big of a deal. And again, 
if it does bother you that much, go support a local tequila brand then that's actually about this life, that's actually from Mexico, that's, you know, you know, um, in the midst of, uh, that's kind of situated in the midst of some sort of gangland warfare or something. Go and support them if your time is, you know, if you're that bothered, as opposed to just worrying about what Kendall and Jello is doing. That's, that, that's why sometimes I can be a little bit more distant with the topics I talk about and sort of speak about them from an outside perspective. I don't really take any credit for that. Some people leave me comments saying, oh my God, it's so good that you, you know, you're so rational about these things, but it's like, mm, I don't think I'm that rational. I just think because I have so much stuff going on outside of all the stuff I talk about, it just, I can just watch it as just entertainment. It's just like pure entertainment. Oh my God, that's crazy that this is happening. And I can notice little trends because I'm just away from it. I'm not really, I'm not like, um, what do you call it? I'm not in it and I'm not obsessed with it in that way. It's just, I don't know. Sometimes that's why sometimes I have a little bit of sympathy with people that are obsessed with politics. I couldn't imagine. Like sports is already enough for me, right? Being into sports and knowing how powerless you are as a fan, especially a fan of Man United and what the Gladys are doing with my club, it kind of really, you know, humbles you a little bit in terms of knowing where your place is. So I'm kind of a bit like, you know what? I can rant and rave about how the Gladys are ruining United, but really, no matter how many scarves I wear, no matter how many hashtags I use online, they're going to decide to leave the club when they decide to leave the club. We're not going to do any, we're not going to force them out any sooner than they want to actually leave. So it kind of allows you to be a little bit like, you know what, the world is as it is. I'm just going to try my best to enjoy the time I have available. Whereas the people in politics have this weird, I guess people that are into politics, it seems like they have this weird idea that somehow they are literally going to change things especially on a global or on a national scale. Maybe local politics, for sure, you could definitely impact change. I have a couple of friends of mine who are, you know, um, what you call it, uh, members of the Green Party and stuff, are doing some really great stuff in the community. I have some friends of mine that are doing some great stuff in terms of anti-knife crime in the community. Some really cool initiatives. But in terms of overall changing, you know, public consciousness through politics, like... You're better off creating a great product and then using that product and that notoriety and that platform to then spread your message as opposed to getting into politics. Why do you think all these people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and stuff can't stop shutting up about global issues? Well, not Jeff Bezos, maybe more so Elon Musk. Why don't you think he can't stop, you know, he can't help himself getting in front of a camera? Because that's basically the best option or the best route to actually impact change and to actually affect people and to actually influence people and change their minds. Creating a product that people will actually enjoy and love and then using that as an opportunity to basically Trojan horse your way into a conversation. That's honestly the best way to do it. But anyway, what do I know? What the hell do I know? Anyway, we're going to get jump on into the show. Loads of things to talk about. So if you've got yourself a little drink, definitely grab one. I've got myself a little water, as you can tell, because I'm still fasting, still on that game, doing that thing. You know how it is. So um, if you've got something else to nibble on, whatever, make sure you get that and let's jump on in. Mm. 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 Nothing like a good old bottle of water after 16 hours of fasting. <laughs> You gotta have to convince your brain that it's tasty, isn't it? <laughs> is there anything worse when you see someone? Honestly, that's maybe a trend that I only notice. But is, it, is, it, is there anything worse when you see when you're on a train or you're out and about somewhere and you see somebody, you know, clearly obese, but they're like holding onto a bottle of water or a flask and drinking it on the train or something? It's like, like the water isn't gonna, <laughs> water's not gonna magically make all those pounds, you know, melt away from your body, mate. You're going to have to put down the, the Kit Kats and the double cheeseburgers. That might be a good option to go around it. But I always find that hilarious. How people, Some people are like, like um, I think I saw a video actually of um, Wings of Redemption live streaming. And he he's another one of those kind of guys. He's always got a bottle of water next to him drinking a bottle of water. It's like, don't get me wrong. It's better than nothing because I think there are some people in those my, my 400 pound life guys who are like allergic to vegetables and the taste of water makes them bath. So... Fair enough, that's better than nothing, but, you know, you have to couple up the water and the sleeping well and the working out to actually make some effective change, but again, what can you do? So, first things first, obviously, things are opening up and back to some semblance of normality here in the UK. You're able to dine indoors, drink indoors, go to bingos and all that malarkey, and people are happy, happy again, and I'm not going to lie, it makes me happy to see young people happy. I hate birthdays. I think celebrating your birthday over the age of 21 is our worded, but I'm also very happy when I see other people enjoying themselves, right? I just heard now on a Tim Dillon's podcast, um, his producer Ben mentioned something that made me legitimately want to throw up in my mouth, but supposedly T Ben's wife um, is really into birthdays and they have this thing in their relationship where for a whole month before, yeah, for a whole month before, yeah, no, sorry, for um, 
on the day when sorry let me start again yeah ben's wife is really into birthdays and for some reason she's got this odd thing that she does where every week leading up to ben's birthday she buys him a birthday present but for some reason she started really early this year because she got too excited. So she's buy she's been buying Ben a she's been buying him a birthday present since you know this week May, and I'm guessing next week again and the following week until his actual birthday, which is at the end of June, which is legitimately one of the most cringiest things I've heard. But also fills me with glee that there's somebody out there that enjoys birthdays that much. So when I'm seeing people like this, or which I'm going to play in this clip, enjoying themselves and having a semblance of normality, doing the most mundane things, are like going to bingo go seeing their grandchildren it really does make me smile and really does make me hopeful for the future it really really does so let's play the clip and then we'll go on it from the other side whatever nagging doubts there are the next step has been taken that even my grandfather now he's got both vaccines but he's still quite cautious like he doesn't really He's still a bit anxious about having a hug and, you know, but he's very excited about the pubs being open. Very excited. Ah, oh, bless him. We don't know what other variants may may come to the surface. So there's no way of knowing, but you just got to take, take it as it comes, don't you, I suppose? But people have been hugging for the last couple of weeks and this is more or less saying kicking. Now, you can hug families and everything and get on with families, family life as normal. <laughs> you know what's funny, right? It's funny that people in the UK are so... It's, pe it's funny that you hear people from the UK saying stuff like, I can't wait to get back to hugging people. When if you're familiar with being in the UK, we're probably the most untouchy and public display of, you know, emotions and feelings ever. The whole stiff upper lip thing in the UK for British people is a real thing. We hate to show our emotions. We hate public displays of affection. We hate it. You can be on a train... I think the UK is the only place in my life which I've legitimately been on a train and seen a couple kissing and smooching on the underground and seen people visibly angry and move seats and make a noise. Like, oh, fucking. Like, mumble under their breath. Other places you might see people roll their eyes and look at their phones because it's a bit awkward. But the only place I've seen people legitimately look visibly angry where if the guy or girl makes eye contact with them, they're going to say something or stand up from their seat and go somewhere else has been in the UK. We hate public displays of affection. So for us to be in a place where we're longing to get hugs from randoms and from family is really a marker of how devastating the lockdowns have been. It's really a marker. It's ground us down so much that it's fundamentally changed us as human beings, which is why I am super suspicious or super hesitant to say that things are going to go back roaring to normal as before, because I don't know. I think some of that lingering damage is going to be it's going to be felt for a long time. Like as that lady said in the beginning, her granddad has got like what? Her grandfather's has like two shots already and is still afraid of going outdoors. So I'm not too sure how we're going to get rid of that residual sort of like psychological pain. But God damn it. Imagine, man, the COVID has made us people in the UK long for hugs. What a world we live in. Tony only lives a few doors away from his grandson, Rue. But for most of this two year old's life, they've just not been able to do this. Just a hug and a kiss. He gets you through it. Rue looks happy. He gets you through it. <laughs> Losing his sister. Bless him. He got me through it. This little lad, he's just got his own magic. <laughs> you know, whatever sadness you've had, and whatever joys you've had, and it's all gone. It's just start again now. Just start again. Yeah, I'll put the tomatoes back. This is a day for the quiet majority, for the people who haven't just given up or decided to do whatever they want. It is the majority who have got us to this point, and many of them have made the sacrifice of their lives. Many more students are now back on campus, but some believe that May the 17th is just far too late. Usually we, you know, we'll interact with people in lectures and have tutorials and you know, meet at coffee shops and stuff, but... Man, how I miss being fresh-faced and just giddy about being around my friends and being in a university and just, you know, just happy with life. Like, wasn't that a time... Don't you look back on that era? And even if you didn't go to college or you didn't go to university, just that era in that time, because this kid looks, what, just probably oldest, maybe 19, 18 years old? Do you remember how that felt? How good it was just to get up at night? 
just sorry, to get up in the morning, stay up late at night, sorry, how amazing you felt at life, like, just, oh, the electricity is just pulsed, same from, look how fresh his face is, his skin's all taut and stuff, look how his hair's all full, loving life, man, what an era, you actually enjoyed being in libraries, right, fooling around, revising, right, trying to chat up some girl you're into, like, you know, walking past some dude that you like, shaking your little yoga punt, your, your little yoga pant Batty, <laughs> yeah, do you remember that era? What a good time to be alive, man. Now look at us. Oh, God. Old and washed up. <laughs> I haven't been able to do any of it, so it's been a bit sort of like the only interaction we're getting is over Teams and Zoom. I've been at home, like, in my um, hometown since December. I've That's dread, isn't it? That's existential dread. I've been at home, <laughs> went to kill myself. <laughs> like, that's how you, the only way to deal with that. This is the only way you can deal with having to be locked indoors for 14 months. Imagine how, honestly, just imagine, just picture it for a moment. You're a university student, right? You, you're from a really strict household. You're not allowed to go out and enjoy yourself and do what young kids do. So in a weird way, you're using the, the avenue and the process of going to university as an opportunity for you to blossom and to fly free and do the things that you've always wanted to do. Get drunk, hook up with people, you know, stay up late, whatever it is, play computer games until your eyes completely bleed. Whatever your sense of freedom is, that's what you were longing for. And then boom, out of nowhere, this flipping virus comes over from China and eradicates all possibilities of you living on your own for once in your life and you have to move back home after talking all that big talk about what you're going to do in university you're now having to you know get back on your hands and knees and hope your mum hasn't changed your bedroom into another storage cupboard ah! <laughs> i would absolutely be crying i would be crying i'd be doing exactly what she's doing now like <laughs> yeah i've had actually one of the worst times of my life <laughs> i'd be doing the same thing i'd be doing the same thing back to reading like two weeks ago um, so it's been really hard, like, trying to do online learning just from my bedroom. <laughs> hard to keep motivated and everything. Oh. Audiences are back too. All these spaces have sat idle in Cardiff for far too long. Yeah, I've introduced cinemas. a couple of films already today and I had a bit of a cry, I must admit. Um, it was, oh, bless um, her. Yeah, I got very emotional when I started talking to people. So it was a really, um, it was just a lovely feeling, like, kind of like seeing people so happy to be back. Well, life and honestly, has been on hold. honestly, what do people, that's what I'm saying, the damage that COVID has done. She, this woman is clearly a movie fanatic, right? The kind of person that will legitimately recommend you a film, you know, in the middle of nowhere. Whatever situation you're in, she could recommend a film that will fit your mood and that will give you a different perspective on life. Somebody that's committed their entire life to movies and film. And somehow, within the process of her life, she's managed to acquire a cinema, manage a cinema, work in a cinema, whatever it is. She's now sat in a place where she can be the person that's in charge of ensuring what movie's shown, what screen. Dream job for somebody that's involved in that scene. Dream job. Now you don't have that. That's your major part of your life. Like I said before, it's very difficult to have hobbies as an adult. Once you're into something, just enjoy it for as much as you enjoy it for as much as you can, no matter what people say and how cringy they think you are. Enjoy it and have a whale of a time because it's very difficult outside of sports to have a hobby that actually occupies and takes up your time, allows you to meet new, interesting, different people, and just kind of expands your worldview and all that malarkey. She's found it. And now COVID has happened and we're in lockdown. What does that person do? I'd hate to think of the amount of lives that have been lost due to lockdown of people within that movie space. People that live vicariously, you know, whose kind of only purpose in life is to go to uh, biennales and to go to film premieres and to go to workshops and all that malarkey. When that gets taken away from you, what are you doing day to day? And what did the government do to kind of help you along the way in that, in that regard? Give you funds? Give you support? So you can't open your doors. Like, look how happy she was at the knowledge of people coming in and being excited to watch movies. People getting people getting excited to go into a cinema gets her off. That's what keeps her up at night. That's what makes her want to go to work in the morning. The thought of being able to share this passion that she has with other people. Then it gets taken away from you. That's why I'm saying, honestly, lockdowns are far worse than the actual inevitability of some people, unfortunately, passing away. It's just, it's just one of those things. We can't ever, ever go to a situation again if this ever happens again. Extensive lockdowns like this just can't happen. The only way that we can actually 
the only way lockdowns have been demonstrated to actually work that we've seen so far is what we've seen in New Zealand, what we've seen in parts of Australia, what we've seen in parts of Southeast Asia. But again, those kind of places were able to maybe lock down their borders. They were able to be a bit more strict with who comes in and out. They were able to be stripped with some of the kind of restrictions, blah, 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 blah. blah. And obviously with places like, places like Australia and New Zealand, they're essentially an island, so it's a bit more easier. But if you're like a landlocked country in the EU or if you're a landlocked you know, state within America, it's fairly difficult difficult to make lockdowns effective and to make them work the only way you can make it work is to be super strict and super hard in the beginning for a short period of time and then let things open up extensive lockdowns just because the numbers keep going up just do more damage than good they really do feeling like kind of like seeing people so happy to be back while life has been on hold births deaths and celebrations have all been muted this is a little sign to say happy birthday from Aww. Aww. Happy Bless you. <laughs> until today I've been out quite a lot sitting in the garden, so I've kind of been literally taking hand warmers with me, loads of layers, scarves, everything, so it's nice to be able to sit in a t-shirt <laughs> inside, yeah. not worry about the weather as well. Yeah, I think it's the same here. I mean, a lot of people have had birthdays. I've had a birthday as well, and again, a bit sat in the garden, like packing like you're going for a sleepover, bringing blankets and everything, like gloves and hand warmers and sitting there, so it's definitely much nicer to be indoors finally. It will take time to readjust to all this. And however many bumps may lurk in the roadmap ahead, we are slowly moving towards freedom. Tom Parmenter, Sky News. Oh, mate. So, yeah, freedom at last, freedom at last. We're going back to some semblance of normality. But honestly, it just breaks my heart seeing that so many people had to suffer like this during this time, man. But I guess, you know, the silver lining is that we're now back to some semblance of normality, some semblance of normality. And talking about normality, talking about things that might give you hope for the future, Look at what happened with that event. Remember that event I covered the other day or covered, you know, a couple of episodes ago? They had basically a trial event that took place in Liverpool, uh, a trial rave where they essentially wanted to um, ensure that the protocols that they had in place were working and ensure that if large amounts of people gather in an open space or in a closed environment such as a rave, that there wouldn't be an outbreak of COVID. Well, look what happened. This is courtesy of the Times. Exclusive. Just 15 positive COVID tests among thousands who flocked to Wembley and Brit Awards. So I guess it was, well, three events, I guess, overall, Wem the Wembley, Brit Awards, and um, the one in Liverpool. So let's, go, let's continue here with the article. So the following. <clears throat> Just 15 people among the 58,000 who took part in the government-run trials for the reopening of large events tested positive for COVID, the Telegraph can reveal. Um, the trials included the FA Cup final, the semi-final at Wembley, the Brit Awards at O2, and DJ sets at the Circus Nightclub in Liverpool. So they covered basically the whole remit of events that you'd want in order to kind of get an understanding as to why, what works and what doesn't. You've got arenas, you've got stadiums kind of things with the, with the O2 arena, and then you've got the sort of like open, you know, sort of like open warehousey sort of space. So everything sort of ticked off. It continues. The low rate of infection seen during the events research program has delighted officials and raised of hopes that mass events can safely reopen this summer, June 21st. Cannot wait, cannot wait. Let's get loaded, let's get wrecked. The final touches are being made for the report making recommendations expected to be handed to Boris Johnson within days. The main findings will be that large events can be conducted largely if mitigating measures such as pre and post event testing and improved ventilation are used. It increases the chances that Mr. Johnson will push ahead with reopening large events on June 21st, although any such reopening is likely to come with rules of how they can uh, be staged. Obviously, there was some trepidation out there because people were worried about this new Indian variant of the, this new Indian variation of the virus or new Indian variant of the virus, whatever it is, right? But it's looking like things can go back to some semblance of normality and I cannot wait. Um, the events research program, which ran through April and May, saw nine different events with large crowds, with live crowds, sorry, um, each is designed with and monitored by the scientists. They also included the World Snooker Championship in Sheffield, a business conference and festival Republic gig in Liverpool, and a reunion 5K run in Kempton Park in Surrey. It's actually criminal that you can't go on a park run now at the moment. You can go to a supermarket and, you know, browse around all the cold food aisles and stand around talking to some, some security guards and having a flipping fry up in a coffee shop, but you can't go on a 5K park run. How does that make sense? Jesus Christ. Roughly 58,000 people in total who attended the events were required to take part in or take a, both a PCR test and a lateral flow test before and afterwards. Multiple sources told the Telegraph that just 15 positive COVID cases have so far been detected. And you also have to imagine over 
the course of those events, the ages and the ages and weights and, you know, races and all that people, people that did get the COVID test or the, you know, the 15 positive ones kind of does vary a lot. So it does give hope to events to go through because there's no like common theme that runs through people that got the positive test. This is flipping amazing. And I'm assuming now because people are now getting um texts. Um, some of my friends have also got texts of going um to go get vaccines. So that's going to get rolled out fairly quickly. So we're going to get back to some semblance of normality very soon. I cannot wait. It's understood some of those people were tested before the events, meaning they, they were not able to attend. Um, others tested positive afterwards. So nice mix there. It remains possible that other positive tests from the most recent events could um, emerge with the FA Cup final and reunion 5K only having taken place last weekend. One theory for how some people may have tested negative on the way in but positive afterwards is that they have only just caught the virus and not yet been infectious. Um, other factors may be at play with a low positive rate likely to reflect in the low levels of COVID being detected in the wider population. Uh, another question is whether everyone who attended the events took tests afterwards as required. It remains unclear whether the published version of the final report will include a total number of tests after the events. One source said the study was the most authoritative of the in the world about how large events can safely be reopened. The source said the recommendation would be that you can move forward and you can reopen the event sector. It could be proportionate to do so given the task. All decisions about reopening rest with Mr. Johnson, who would handle the conclusion on multiple reviews as well as the likely state on COVID before deciding what to reopen on June 21st. How the inner variant develops will also be critical to decision making uh, concerns it could also be more transmissible than other cases but we don't care about that i want to get back to normality i really do and i'm glad that this report is basically telling us what we already knew that large-scale events um have just about as much risk as going to a supermarket they always have done but i guess they kind of sacrificed them they were basically the sacrificial lamb to kind of serve a wider purpose in terms of making sure people were compliant um because if you just had raves going on and supermarkets open at the same time people wouldn't really take the virus seriously they wouldn't wear masks when necessary so i guess you had to close down some things and sacrifice it but unfortunately people in that industry had to be the ones that were the sacrificial lamb you know cases of mental health definitely went up some people unfortunately self-expired so it's been a real catastrophe of a situation but hopefully now no more loads of no more lives will be lost no more lives will be greatly impacted by this um you know pause in time and june 21st is only a few weeks away and i cannot wait to go back out and rave again i cannot wait i'm legitimately gonna go out somewhere on the sunday probably gonna go to somewhere really awful like egg or something that's my plan i might go to just egg on a monday and just on sunday night and just get absolutely blasted right just be in the toilet just like taking copious amount of ketamine right getting absolutely wired i don't even like ketamine but i just might do it just because you know what i mean just be like <sighs> come back in the morning all bunged up and stuff that'd be mad i'm gonna do that i might actually do that and do a little vlog i'll probably get deleted off of youtube but it'll do well it'll, it'll get some numbers it'll get me some virality so get me some viral attention some vi virality is that you say it? virality whatever it is yeah um i go doing ketamine in egg <laughs> watch this space if you see me in egg you know trying to you know um spinning in, in a circle you'll know why you'll bloody know why Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's 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 move on. Let's move on. Yeah, this is absolutely great news as well. This is courtesy of Crack. Obviously, great news. Um, obviously a somber event, but good. Great to see um her friends definitely keeping Sophie's memory alive and well. So this is courtesy of Crack Magazine, and it says the following. Friends and collaborators launch an art auction in memory of Sophie, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year. Um, friends and collaborators of Sophie have launched an art auction um, god is trans in memory of the late producer it was organized to honor her radical generosity artistic vision and commitment to supporting the trans community some of the items listed include the ekas lata white dress um, that sophie modeled in 2018 prints by renata raska who captured sophie in a crack magazine cover story and photography prints taken by zoe shate and obviously you can see um sophie there in ekas lata bloody hell man such a loss isn't it um all proceeds in the auction and the sale will go towards a trans justice funding project an american organization that helps to support grassroots trans justice groups across the u.s in april aj cook posted a tribute to sophie which is quite possibly one of the best tributes i've ever seen of somebody that passed it was so so touching you could tell they had such a great loving artistic and personal relationship i definitely recommend you check out that tribute that aj cook writ amazing amazing tribute um tribute to sophie online saying the following 
She was a laser focused and exceptionally intelligent, but also sensitive and perceptive. Um, it didn't matter whether we were talking about people or relationships or materials or music. She approached every topic with love, care and sensitivity and intensity of someone who is truly loved. Head over to God is Trans to check out the auction. You can donate to the Trans Justice Funding Project directly here. So make sure you go do that. If you're a fan of Sophie and Sophie's legacy and the artistic you know, influence and creativity that she left behind, then definitely go do that. Definitely someone that's gone too soon. Somebody that I would greatly miss. Somebody that I was so looking forward to seeing live. Uh, definitely was on my bucket list. And, you know, I miss so many great occasions to see Sophie live, especially here in London, always DJing and playing live gigs. And, you know, unfortunately, this person that passed away. So if anything that we can learn from this is to savor and to honor your artistic heroes when you can, when they're right here. Um, don't wait until another moment because you're never going to you're never going to know if that another moment is going to come along. But, yeah, uh, big up all the friends and collaborators and definitely make sure you check out this was it called again let's double check da, 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 da. it's called god is trans check out that tribute you were to find it google it um donate if you can donate if you can moving on we have excellent news excellent news courtesy of wall street journal this is pretty dope isn't it pretty dope news but i guess if you're a fan of noah you're going to be a little bit upset because inevitably this is going to definitely take away from the quality of product that you're going to get in the main noah brand but hey onwards and upwards so this is courtesy of the wall street journal it says the following j crew naming former supreme designer to disrupt brand brendan babsian veteran streetwear pioneer is being hired to push the limits of the preppy retail designs if you're familiar j crew um, the only time I, 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 I uh, J Crew was actually a big thing was when that lady was there. Was it Jenna Lyons, right? When she was really kind of pushing that thing forward. Um, when they were doing copious amounts of great New Balance collaborations. Um, you know, oh yeah, their New Balance collaborations were sick. I've actually, I'm actually still having, I've, hey, I got them up here. Look how great the new the J Crew New Balance collaborations were back in the day. Like really, like just tastefully done. This is not back in this, like you know, only a couple of years ago. But still, tastefully done collaborations where they take like an existing model from New Balance from Nike and just update the colorway in a very classic way. Obviously, you got this great Nike kill shot there. Probably one of the better um, tennis shoes that Nike have actually put out. Sometimes the front of them can be a bit frumpy, but I like the overall shape of these. Right, just done in a nice white and pine green colorway where there's some uh, gray accents you would call them on the mud guard the lace stays and the hill tab at the back then you've got another collaboration here with new balance also just a very nicely done um what model is this 998 yeah 998 in a navy colorway with some nice white laces to kind of offset all of it on the middle so just fairly done right you can already see the kind of um taste level what comes with them when they're putting together collaborations right it's always kind of very muted colorways it's just done on updated models and something that you can obviously see you wearing with a pale with a pair of tailored slacks you know with a double-breasted jacket right very very well done um another one here an m998 independence day model which might be one of my favorites actually with the white and the red there right just very very expertly done um, so yeah, um, just to, you know, a great brand that kind of lost its way over the years, and it looks like they're tapping one of maybe the better or maybe one of the best uh, streetwear designers out there, uh, Brendan Babson, who's a former designer of Supreme. Um, maybe was responsible for some of my greatest pieces from Supreme, pieces that I probably would still go back and rebuy. Um, uh, an example being this, the following: Brendan Babson was at Supreme when he designed this, right? The Supreme Vento Parker from two thousand nine. Um, you know, famous famously modeled by Aaron Bondaroff in that lookbook right classic classic jacket one of my you know you know favorite jackets I've got from Supreme I've actually got a picture of me wearing uh, a jacket actually yeah no that's that's the what was that one that's a wilderness parka I've actually got a picture of me wearing the the vento yep that's me wearing the vento jacket back in the day that's me wearing the vento jacket as well back in the day where is it there can you see me let's get this out of the way 2009 you see that 2009 on this fit here, I've got some vintage, right? Vintage Bruins, like old school Bruins. You can actually see they were actually a bit too small for me. There's a little bit of a bulge sticking out there. But these Bruins are from like the 70s when they were originally made. Like, and I sold them. Such an idiot. Um, with some uh, Levi's jeans, uh, Ventil Parker. I've got a denim Ralph Lauren shirt there with maybe a hundred white tee under the end. Remember that was a big thing people used to do? You'd wear like a baggy shirt with like a white tee underneath and have the bottom bit sticking out a little bit. Uh, the Ventil Parker there in an XL. Um, I've got a Supreme, if I'm not mistaken, that's a 13th backpack, 13th, I think, or 12th, one of them. It's like a turtle show. It comes in a gray, a chocolate brown, and also a black, 
Um, so that was me wearing that. So that he's responsible for one of those. He's also responsible for obviously the Wilderness Parker, which was maybe one of my favorite uh, Parkers of all time. I want to definitely buy this back sometime in the future. Obviously, I had this colorway here, the red and uh, the red and navy, as you can see, me wearing the red and navy there with some Padmore and Barnes wallabies that were again too small for me. That was a classic thing of me back in the day. I used to always wear shoes that were too small. <laughs> look at my feet bulging out there. Look how look how dis dis uh, misshapen they are there. My toes all sticking out on that bit there. And then I've got some Unico. Oh, these were when U Unico did those amazing chinos. These chinos are like, um, what were they? Oh. They, had some, they had an amazing gold button fly. Um, uh, really nice snap buttons. They're just a really heavy weight to them. They didn't obviously keep making them that way because I'm sure they were probably fairly expensive to make them in that way. Let's get rid of that sign there. And then, of course, we're in the Wilderness Parker with, if I'm not mistaken, uh, what was that brand that made them? Um, the Oxford shirts. I forgot, but some brand that used to collaborate with Supreme that made the Oxford shirts. I'm wearing that as well in the in-between there. Like, I used to love this shit, man. I used to love it. So, yeah, so, so Brendan Babbage, I'm very familiar with him. Again, like I said, he was definitely responsible for some of my greater Supreme moments and definitely pieces that I definitely would go back and wear nowadays. So, to see him get tapped by J. Crew makes complete sense considering the kind of stuff that they do, considering what he's done, obviously, with Noah. Just look at what he's wearing there in terms of fit. That could easily fit into what J. Crew doing going forward. But, like I said, if you're a fan of J. Crew, or so if you're a fan of Noah, you're going to be a little bit nervous because this might mean that the quality of Noah's output might be a little bit, you know, it might diminish over the time because unfortunately, no matter how creative Brendan Vab is in, which I'm not assuming he isn't, um, there's no way that you can, you know, adequately um, allocate your resources to two projects at the same level of output just not going to be able to do you know, you're not going to be able to do it it's just one of those things something's going to give it's obviously beneficial to keep yourself you know going with different creative projects on the go as much as you can because one one project can also inform another but in terms of actually you know affecting your bread and butter which is Noah it's definitely going to affect it but I think going forward, it's going to be great to see uh, Brendan Babijan visions for streetwear, um, given the platform, large platform of J Crew has, and maybe affect change in a really meaningful way. Right? He might alter the cut of a pant, and that might go into informing the cut of a pant for seasons and years to come. It could be a whole completely different thing that changes. So I'm really for it. So let's read the article itself. It says J Crew Group Inc., the retailer known for its preppy styles, is turning to an occasional Mohawk sporting designer with a skateboarding pedigree to revive the struggling brand. The company on Monday is naming Brendan Babson as co-owner of the Coltry, um New York menswear label Noah and longtime design director at the pioneering streetwear brand Supreme to the role of J. Crew men's creative director, which is awesome. His first design will hit stores in this, at the second half of 2022. So it's awesome too that they just got him to do the menswear. They didn't try and spread him thin by doing the women's wear also, which he, I'm sure he probably could have done, but wouldn't have really kind of uh, Landed within an expert skill set. Uh, Mr. Babison Hire is a sharp turn for J. Crew, which emerged as a retail force in the 90s for defining the preppy dress code of the upper middle class Americans. A 49 year old native Long Island made his name in fashion during 14 years of Supreme, whose t shirts and hoodies bo um, bearing the company's bright red and white box circles have a cult like following among young adults. It says the following We need to disrupt the business, said J. Crew's chief executive, Libby Waddle, who took over the retail in November after it emerged from bankruptcy. Yeah, true, innit? It was on the brink of bankruptcy and it just got saved if i'm not mistaken at the last minute man so it's amazing to see that going forward so we'll see an updated looks on this sort of j crew you know what i mean this sort of preppy appeal um j crew filed for bankruptcy protection last year after a long period of declining sales and management turnover the company was late to adapt as more shoppers shifted to fast fashion chains and online shopping it also has been criticized for being out of step with the consumer trends uh, starting in 2008 under the guidance of menswear designer frank mutants um j crew steered at a clothing direct clothing towards italian fabric dress shirts and it uh, <coughs> leather dress shoes and slender suits by around 2010 men's fashion shifted towards streetwear and sneakers and j crew was slow to keep up oh yeah true imagine imagine you hire this guy to do to kind of redesign the j crew menswear and then he starts and it goes off pretty well don't get me wrong 2008 might have been a bit late for the whole italian thing 
right um the slender cuts and uh what those called um all those shoes with the two straps on it but it's a bit late for that kind of thing and then suddenly 2010 everyone's wearing jeans and new era hats it's like oof off, off, off. Um, Mr. Waddle, who previously headed Madwell and J. Crew's Denim Focus sub label, said the classic styles will continue to be important to J. Crew's menswear business. At the same time, she's looking for Mr. Babian to push the limits of his designs. Mr. Babian said that he was trying to strike a balance between the eccentricities and the broad taste of shoppers who visit the chain's 150 stores, often in search for button down shirts for the office. He said his visions for J. Crew will focus on fundamental pieces, echoing the clean cut American look and the brand pushed throughout the 80s. Mr. Babian and said J. Crew's catalogs, which he first discovered as a friend's house in the mid 1980s, were really inspirational to him as a designer. Mr. Babin intends to place the brand's no fuss basics front and center again, which is true. If you think about Noah's aesthetics and you think about what J. Crew wants to do, they're quite interlinked, right? There's a lot of synergy there. And if you think, and if he just focuses on making sure the button down Oxfords, the chinos, um, the light colored denims, um, the chino shorts, the cargo shorts, uh, maybe a classic pair of shoes, like maybe similar to like a, you know, like a deck shoe, like he kind of update that look and has like maybe two or three shoes that fit really well within the whole wardrobe, a nice overcoat, double breasted jacket, whatever. There are staples within that preppy look that, you know, a great beanie that just comes in season in season that people like a great pullover hoodie that he could do really well in if he just kind of nails those and then of course sprinkles some eccentric pieces here and there but if he just nails the ability of t of getting those kind of you know those um quintessential uh preppy wardrobe staples he's gonna be a great success at j crew i don't deny it but again like i said will it negatively affect noah at least in kind of you know who knows I wonder if they're going to continue doing the sneaker collaborations, whether or not he's actually in charge of the sneaker collaborations or whether the sneaker collaborations come out of the someone else's umbrella. I'm not too sure, but they keep, you know, they keep pumping them out. But the, that era previously where they were doing, again, like I said, like that Nike kill shot, yeah? Like really, really good, right? Like really, really nice, nicely, nicely done. So I wonder if he's going to be in charge of doing those things also. I'm not too sure, but it continues here. Can someone walk in to a store and take something as simple as a chino and a t-shirt and make it look good? He said, it'll be my job to show people how to do that. He plans to keep the brand's popular slim fitting Ludlow suit, though he said he would look into adding new fits and even pleated pants for consumers who prefer looser fits. Mr. Waddle said that the coming of the pandemic, shoppers are looking for more relaxed silhouettes, of course, definitely because everyone's put on a bit of weight. It would be awesome if he's able to design like the quintessential oxford shirt that works really well in terms of nine to, in terms of your day-to-day -day work and also able to go out with it that'll be awesome to be able to kind of meld those two things or you know mesh those two things that'll be flipping amazing mr babians will continue to operate noah alongside his wife estelle bailey Bab babson also noah is the more grown-up label than supreme offering striped dress shirts cashmere suits uh beachy striped tees noah's 52 dollar pocket tees and 128 trip pinstripe uh, button ups are nearly double the price of similar styles at J. Crew. Um but I do remember what's a classic thing that I remember him. The one piece I remember, because I um, if I'm not mistaken, Brendan did start Noah when he was at Supreme, but then put it on ice. Then when he left, he's restarted it again. And if I'm not mistaken, there's one quintessential piece that I've not been able to find. If I don't know, if you're a Supreme fanatic out then you know it. But Supreme did this parka, maybe it was in the early two thousand, it was like a fisherman's parka that had like big uh big stripes, so it was like a white and navy stripe like across the body. And it was like a fisherman's parker classic. That to me is what I would un is what I would kind of use as an example of what um, Brendan could possibly do at J Crew, because um, already you saw some of the codes that he was kind of you know sprinkling in with some of the stuff that he did obviously when he was at Supreme. But that Supreme jacket, I can't find out which one it was, but it was a kind of fisherman's jacket. Definitely had a hood on it, and it had massive uh, stripes going across it in navy and white and I think the other colorway might have been yellow and something else but it was a classic classic jacket if someone can find it where it is definitely let me know because I want to add it to my um, you know stuff that I want to buy in the future grail list and stuff it says here Mr. Ballion said that he intends to take J. Crew into a Noah pricing tier oh he doesn't intend to take it okay thank god uh, but the, the pricing was a continuing discussion him and Mr. Waddle said that they were both focused first on raising the quality of J. Crew styles Noah is also known for more um, tear designs like a 1498 cheetah print overcoat and a punkish 80 dollar 88 dollar pink and black sneakers made in collaboration with vans mr babian said that he's eager to sprinkle some of his unexpected elements into j crew's collections he says i'm still me my design sensibility isn't going to change mr babian said who during his first interview um 
who during his first interview wore a 1980s era log jacket made out of skateboard company Pal Prata. He says it's got a lot more rope and room to push. Oh, awesome. So imagine that. Imagine he's able to make an Oxford jacket with gussets and stuff and, you know, um, a different sort of cut so that if you work in a construction or you work somewhere, would you wear an Oxford shirt for construction? Probably you would, right? But so you can move your arms a little bit more, maybe a chino, uh, chino shorts that would look great in the office and also outside the office i see a lot of scope for some really interesting stuff going forward then he did another interview here it looks like with gq it looks like also so let's definitely double check that and see what he said in the gq interview let's pause this we don't want that to play i hate all these autoplay videos this is really crappy when they do that sort of stuff and these autoplay videos and websites because they use those stats of you play because basically what they do to be cheeky is that these brands and these websites, in order to get more sponsorship, they'll use the fact that you clicked on an article and the video replayed automatically. And sometimes they have these really cheeky websites where they refresh in the background by themselves if you keep them idle. So it refreshes every five minutes if you've got a tab open. So effectively what that means is that on their end, analytics wise, you basically press play on this video, you know, 17 million times and they add it to their numbers so that when they make in a deck and they want to get more sponsorship, the numbers are inflated. The people will be like, oh, wow, you got like, you know, uh, 1 billion views on the videos. It's like, no, they didn't. No one watched it 1 billion times. They just had it embedded in a flipping article like this so that it has no correlation to what Ace and Rocky is talking about. It's super annoying. But anyway, we digress. Um, he says, duh, 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 duh. yeah, so this is what Brendan said to GQ directly via email. He said, um, more than anything, I think I'm bringing a youthful spirit, but with experience. He says, there's no plans to reinvent the brand, according to Babington, who will take the chains off a bit and get a bit creative. So it's awesome to see. So there's definitely feels that there's going to be some battle with the pricing, but I think it should be good. Um, he says here, my friends and I wore mixed traditional items, which were often J. Crew with brands we loved uh, from surf and the skate world. It wasn't uncommon to be wearing J. Crew chinos and pullovers and windbreakers with a sushi hat. And that probably would sound crazy to a young person today. But if you look back at old photos, you'll see it. Of course. And that's what I said I did, right? That's what I did. I've got I've got J. Crew, well, our version is maybe Uniqlo, but I'm essentially wearing, you know, basic stuff that you'd get maybe in the high street and also mixing it in with like actual brand brand stuff, right? So it's like a let's say for instance, that's a unique that's a Uniqlo Chino and that's a shirt from J. Crew mixed in with a piece from Supreme. People used to do that all the time. Nowadays, I guess kids are probably more head to toe designer, but we used to be a little bit way more creative back in the day, innit? Way, way, way more creative. Um it continues here. Ba 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 ba. Of course that's how today's customer style dress too. Um ba, ba, ba. what else did you say here? To be honest, I thought it'd be no chance that it would really come together, he said. When I asked about his new partnership, I assumed I was one of many being considered. It's actually quite gnarly, right? That you spend your entire life kind of designing and being informed by this, you know, high street, you know, retail chain, doing your own thing. And then little by little, over time, you then become one of the perfect candidates for the role in question. Now, who knows? Maybe this is part of their designer, you know, um, story. After the fact, everyone's got like, a, whenever someone gets a collaboration with a brand, the first thing they say is, oh my God, I remember when I was a kid, I used to wear Reebok to the school. And, you know what I mean? Everyone's got some sort of, you know, dumb ass story like that. So maybe he's lying, but I don't, it doesn't strike me like that. Well, I've met Brett, Brett I met Noah. No, I met Brendan um, a couple of times when I went to New York, specifically when I worked for this company and we were doing an online streetwear course and I had to go to the store with a few of my other colleagues and we spoke to him and a few of the staff members there and they couldn't be nicer. Like legitimately some of the best people that I've ever met in streetwear, people that will legitimately, um, you know, make you a little bit more hopeful of the future because one of the best, one of the worst things that you can do if you're a fan of streetwear is to go into a retail store and ask questions and be like inquisitive and interested in things you're into because you're going to be met with a wall of just you know bad vibes and icing you out similar to what skate stores do when the first time you go there right they give you you know they, they kind of ice you out a bit and look at you with you know uh, look down upon you and make you kind of you know question your sanity because they want to make sure that you're the right kind of person and you're not coming in there for the wrong reasons which is absolutely insane but they were nice off the bat off the bat and they didn't know us too we didn't introduce ourselves straight away we kind of walked in just had a peruse around and it was so nice the whole staff like he hires really well like everyone that works in noah like is a kind of reflection of basically brendan and basically what he's doing with that brand so i'm not i, I wouldn't be surprised if you know the, the thing is complete success going forward i really wouldn't be um Blah, blah, blah. no more comment there for brendan so yeah definitely check that out when that gets announced um for sure that's going to be something that a lot of people are going to be excited about Next on the list, we have more news from fashion, 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 fashion. 
This is courtesy of the Daily, the Daily Front Row, the Daily, the Daily Front Row reports quite shockingly that Emanuela Alt is out of Vogue Paris. <gasps> Who would have guessed it? Obviously, most of us would have guessed it with all the restructuring that they're doing over there at Condé Nast. I think loads of other, you know, uh, location Pacific Vogue's got, you know, absorbed into other regions or got completely scrapped overall. Editors leaving left, right and center and not posting any farewell messages and stories of discontent behind the scenes. Just absolute calamity. And if you're really smart or if you're really attentive, you would notice that a lot of this maybe was as a consequence of all the stuff that happened with Bon Appetit. When Bon Appetit happened and Condé Nast basically stood firm and said, nah, we're not caving. We're not giving minorities and everyone else that works in this company more money to appear or the same money as some of the, their white colleagues. We don't care. This is how we do our business. And everyone decided to you know, either leave or stay when they kind of you know put their uh, foot down and said, this is how we're going to do our thing. I think that signaled a change that they decided, you know what, we're just going to revamp the entire thing. We're just going to, you know, start all over again. And unfortunately, some of the more storied labels and some of the more storied magazines, so specifically, were the ones that are on the chopping block. So, but this is quite mad to see. And also maybe um, an example of the complete shift overall from like street style icons who happen to be editors and people working in magazines and then bloggers and influencers who aren't necessarily involved in the behind the scenes of fashion were mostly just really enthusiastic fans this is definitely the final conclusion if you ever needed that bloggers definitely jumped over the fashion editors and directors and stuff this is definitely an illustration of it even stylists you remember when people used to be obsessed with stylists i forgot who it was but there was this lady who used to wear, she had like a blonde pixie bob. She used to wear all black and she used to always get photograph, uh, photographed by, um, what's his name? The sartorialist. She's also a stylist. Like loads of kind of really famous celebrity stylists. Even a stylist for um, Off-White. Christina Sentara or whatever her name. Is that her name? Right? People don't really care about these people anymore, right? They've kind of gone off the boil. Let me see if I can get her name here. Christina Chris, uh, is it off white? Is it off white style? No, because it's not, isn't it? Is it off white stylist? Because I'm sure, because Louis Vuitton is not Ib Kamara. What, what's her name? Christi, Christian Sinton, Tira Sintra. What is her bloody name, man? Oh, what is her name? It's something, Christina S Stylist. What is her name? What is her name? She's like Australian. But you, you know the drift. You, you know what I mean, right? I'm sure some of you definitely know who I'm talking about. But um, but yeah, people like this, no one really cares about them. Like, unless you're a blogger, no one cares about the editors that actually work behind the scenes anymore. Uh, creative director, Nushun Shan. I'm not sure that's a good person to see. But I can't find what's her name again. Is that Christine? What's her name? Christina. She, Christina. She. The Nana Stylist, what's her name? What is her name, man? Centara. And she's got a brand as well, right? She does that brand. She has a brand where it's like wardrobe staples, right? Centara. Oh, I forgot her name, man. I really did forget her name. Is that her name? Christina Centira? She's Australian. No, it's not her. Oh. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It really, really doesn't matter. Let's move on. Basically, bloggers have taken over the stylist. People who are more more interested in what Brian Boy wears as opposed to what Amalia Alt wears, which is absolutely wild to me to think about how it started and how it's basically going. So it says the following. According to reports, it might be the end of the era at, for Emmanuel Alt. WWE writes that the Vogue Paris editor and chief is set to leave the fashion bible as Condé Nast restructures and reconfigures Mastheads at its European titles. While Condé Nast has yet to confirm the rumour, word is that Alt is set to leave the publication as are Olivier Olivier Lalanne um, at the GQ front and Joseph Goshen, is it or Joseph Hossen, how you pronounce that? Editorial director and Vanity Fair, uh, Vanity Fair France. Dylan Jones, editor in chief of British GQ, just exited his role recently too over the last six months. That's a big one too. Actually, British GQ is leaving, and Dylan Jones, he's been a staple there for a long, long time. Over the last six months, multiple top editors at International Vogue editors have left, including India's Priya Tana, Germany's Christina Arp, um, Spain's Eugene de la Torrente, um, Japan. And Mitsuko Watanabe and longtime Vogue China editorial in chief Angelica Chuang exited in November and as we were replaced by a 27 year old Margaret Zhang earlier this year. So for sure they got her for a cut price 
for a cut price um, salary. 100% sure. Um, I imagine if you're a distant woman, Angela, Angela, Angelica Chung, you're not going to be happy being replaced by a 27-year-old, are you? No matter if she's, I don't know who this Margaret Zhang woman is, but you know, no matter even she's flipping, you know, um, super knowledgeable and wise beyond her years you're gonna definitely take that as a personal affront and obviously this is the latest issue of vogue paris featuring the one and only Halle bieber at the front it says the following mama two alt 53 has a long story to hit fashion uh, history media she began a trajectory with the role of french l in 1984 when she was just 17 years old a notable stylist gained international acclaim as an unassuming street style star herself during a time of vogue paris uh during um director uh, assuming director 22 in 2000 well, mate, mate, I'm not reading this role at all, am I? The notable stylist gained international acclaim as an unassuming street style star herself during her time as Vogue Paris fashion director in the late 2000s. And if the whispers about exit are true, it's unknown where she's headed next. Crazy, isn't it? And maybe this is a consequence, again, of her and Kareen Reutfeld falling out because that was, for me, the end of Vogue Paris. Vogue Paris was super good. I used to buy it all the time. It's probably the only Vogue I religiously did buy, even though most of the editorials you couldn't really understand, unfortunately but it was so good some of the stylings and the editorials were supreme superb especially when Emmanuel Alt and Karen Royford were working hand in hand but something happened they fell out I'm not too sure if because Emmanuel Alt went for Karen Royford's job or something else happened behind the scenes but something happened behind the scenes we haven't really heard anything of the reasons why it happened I'm sure people behind the scenes know and if you do know and you're a fashion head please let me know in the comments I'd love to know what the deal is but Emmanuel Alt was a vibe like she was a vibe. This is a couple of pictures of her from the Sartorialist, but she really did, um, you know, represent an era in history when it comes to street style. Like, it, it, and it, I don't think it can ever be replicated. It really, really can not. Let's see some of her greatest hits here on Google. Like, it really was an era in time that she was around. She was doing some epic stuff out there. The kitten heels, the tight trousers, the double-breasted jackets, the leather jackets. You remember when someone did a, someone put together a zine? This is how people were obsessed with street stylists. Now, I don't think you'd ever get that... I don't think you'd ever get that kind of level of fandom with a blogger. I don't know why, but I just don't think you would do. Someone made a zine of some of Emmanuel O's best moments, quotes from her interview. I think it was in French. I can't find it anywhere, but it was a really limited edition zine. It was hard to get. I didn't buy it at the time, annoyingly. I'm sure it's probably going to be worth a lot of money going forward, but it was a little zine, a little kind of A5 white bit of paper uh, maybe it was, it was printed on a good paper i don't know but it wasn't that well done but it was somebody really a fanatical fan of her that did that and even myself me i made a mix back in the day um a disco to disco mix of some of my sound card i think still to this day where i basically the inspiration behind it was like you know um stuff that could be played within the vogue paris headquarters i think i might have emailed somebody at vogue paris about having it played of course i didn't get any no actually i, I think i emailed it somebody and then i think somebody on fashion spot forum the place that they're super critical about Vogue Paris and what it's kind of become nowadays, but they used to love Emmanuel Alt back in the day too. Some of the threads are maybe still on there on the Fashion Spot forum of every look that she wore, but I think someone on the Fashion Spot forum said that they might have sent it to somebody at Vogue Paris. I don't know if someone saw my mix or not, but I definitely recorded a mix back in the day, a disco to disco mix with like Blood Orange and some other people playing that was super good. Maybe one of my better mixes from back, maybe it was like 10 years ago, I did this mix ages ago and I'm hoping that it crossed their desk, but man, it was an era in time emmanuela alt man she did some great things in terms of street style like people were obsessed with this woman and then looking back on it it's just obviously effortless french chic but it was nothing really loud nothing crazy she was not suzel bubbling the thing out there which you know don't get me wrong Susie bubble this does her thing and people are maybe you know um you know um uh, there's loads of uh, other children out there that exist but in terms of what people get crazy over nowadays in terms of street style this is the complete opposite of it right just chic classic stuff like nothing too crazy not many colors just very well done just amazing even the way she does her hair right that kind of like just woke up maybe i had a quickie in the morning maybe i had to get my kids ready for school whatever it may be like just effortlessly effortlessly cool and I don't think you're ever going to get that level of fandom with a blogger anymore. I don't know why that is. I don't know why. Don't ask me why that happens. But that level of fandom, I don't think you'll get with a blogger. Does she do Pilates or does she just smoke cigarettes and fast all day? Who knows? But she was skinny and slim as hell. She fits into all the clothes effortlessly. She was actually responsible. I don't. She might be responsible because I think that maybe is Isabel Marant's sandals. She might have been responsible for the Isabel Marant thing too. Like Isabel Marant, um, runway stuff was legitimized because of Emmanuel Oh, Nowadays, it's a bit derivative. It's a bit samey. She doesn't really take any risks. It's just boring stuff and you really question who's actually buying that. But 
Emmanuel Alt was the perfect conduit for portraying and displaying those looks out there in the public. Like, classic stuff. Like, really, really well done. She doesn't really have a bad outfit. That might be the loudest thing she's ever worn. She doesn't have a bad outfit. I don't sure. Look at people. Look, we're obsessed with it. See? How to dress like Emmanuel Alt. They were obsessed with her back in the day. She had the era. She had a time in history that I don't think can ever be replicated again. Like, she just looks so good in clothes. Maybe it's just me, but for somebody to look that sexy and hot in trousers is definitely something that has to be commended right maybe it's just me but there's not much skin showing she's not showing like it's not classically what you'd imagine sexy to look like especially nowadays with people twerking all over the place but there's no cleavage there's no bums there's a bit of ankle maybe some a cheeky elbow and a wrist here and there but hardly any skin and just really effortlessly cool effortlessly chic effortlessly sexy and just look at that and i forgot um Oh yeah, that's Geraldine Saglio. That's the other. That's a kind of right hand woman who took up her reins, and that's the kind of girl that was a little bit more adventurous of her clothes. Look at those trousers. Look how well done those pants are. How they look with the kitten heels and the shirt tucked in with the sleeves rolled up. Like just oh, so cool, man. Her and Geraldine Saglio. Are like look at that look. Look, that's Geraldine Saglio. There. That's not Emmanuel. Oh, actually, just super, super, super good. Like she had a. She had an era. She had an era. So for sure. Uh, it'd be for sure behind the scenes like it wouldn't surprise me if people told me she was an absolute nightmare but i love her just looking at her in terms of images online like some of her looks even back in the day you look at that stuff and you say a guy could easily take a look like this and reinterpret it and make it work for him easily right you replace the sat those, those kind of gladiator sandals with a pair of slip-ons you maybe you know have the pants a little bit looser but the way that look just looks overall right that sort of like you know rope you know, maybe as a black dude, I can't wear a rope like that because, you know, of the slave connotations. But overall, right, just look at that effortlessly. The jewelry there, the watch, the necklace, just well, well, well done, isn't it, right? And a, and a somewhat weathered but also refreshed face, right? It's a very French thing, right? They look somewhat tired and also rejuvenated. How do they do it? Nobody knows. But yeah, Emmanuel, oh, is out of Vogue Paris, isn't it? She's out, that's the, her there with her daughter. Look at them. Look how cool they look, her and Jodie Sagmir. I guess that's, is that an American girl that's just kind of, you know, along for the ride or is that her daughter? I'm not too sure, but she doesn't look that great outfit there. You know, the, oh, that might be actually her daughter. They look quite similar there, isn't it? That might be her daughter, I think. And she might be a teenager as well. So I take back the insult. I don't like insulting kids. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, great stuff, innit? Um, yeah, Emmanuel Oates out of Vogue, man. She's out of Vogue. Um, that was an era in time. I still have a couple of her Vogue Paris that she was obviously at the helm of. I wonder what's going to happen going forward. I wonder what's happening going forward. But look at that. Look how effortlessly cool that is. Come on, man. She single-handedly might have brought back the kitten heel. Who else wore Kitten Hills as much as Emanuela Alt and made him look incredible? She was perusing around the Paris streets, going to fashion shows to fashion shows, Milan streets, cobbled roads, and wearing stilettos. Absolutely wild woman. Wild woman, man. Like, wild. Her, Anna Wintour. Um, who's the other lady? The Italian lady that always wears complete runway looks from head to toe. I forgot her name. Anna De La Russo, remember her? Like that was an era in street style, man. Like I said, do as 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 well as as good as some of these other street bloggers and stuff, stylists, stylists are like that. Who's that Italian girl that everyone's obsessed with? That she's on Depop and oh, I used to hate her so much, man. People used to like jump. What's her name? She's blonde, but like super. Like those people aren't really. I don't know what it is, why they don't, they don't necessarily have the same level of fandom that these street star people have. Because I'd imagine in terms of wealth, they're all the same level, right? Every people, most of these people are rich. There, are, there is a small contingent of people that aren't, but for the most part, you look at the Brian Boys and the Susie Bubbles and these kind of people, they come from, you know, wealthy back or not, Brian Boy, maybe not so much, but, you know, they're, they're, they're at least affluent now. So it's not necessarily that much of an achievement to be dressed in these amazing garments. But I don't know, still there was something about her being rich, having all the access to all these brands, but also being able to put it together. It just made it, made it very, very special. So yeah, big up Emmanuel Oh, That might be your only bad outfit, that one. That might be your only bad outfit. Maybe it's the angle. But yeah, she doesn't really have many bad outfits, man. Just effortlessly cool with the white jeans as well, you know, classic Parisian style there, Parisian posh style, white jeans, black boots. That's just effortlessly done. Look at that effortlessly done but yeah um long live emmanuela alt you will be always remembered for just look laying it down like that, that that's that famous saint laurent bag isn't it? if i'm not mistaken if i'm not mistaken the famous saint laurent bag i forgot what the name is but god damn it i know i know a lot about fashion i know i have hobbies i have interest 
what can you do? But yeah, big up Emanuela Alt. Um, hopefully next journey is cool. Hopefully we get some answers as to why her and Kareen Royford actually fell out. If you know, let me know in the comments down below. Hopefully she starts a magazine. Maybe not. She should start a magazine and leave Alexia as is. I know, start a magazine. You know, also it's funny. She also had some of the best moments with Terry Richardson, who doesn't is obviously isn't around for obvious reasons, but some of her editorials with Terry Richardson, Magnifico. But yeah, big up Emmanuel at all. Hopefully she bounces back from this and we see her again in the magazine world because we definitely, she's needed, or she takes up, right? Imagine she goes in collaboration with Flippin' Phoebe Philo and they come back together and she's a stylist and Phoebe Philo's a designer. Oh, dream team, dream team, dream team. Or somebody else. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, that is Excellent Zing Show, episode number 460. Grato says zero. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your company. I've enjoyed every single moment of it. If it's your first time tuning into the show, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. And of course, support via Patreon is welcome. Go on patreon.com for slash Agostino and subscribe to my Patreon today to get access to all of my Patreon content behind the paywall that includes you know movie reviews, bonus episodes once per week. All that thing can only be subscribed to an access via patreon.com for shash agostino patreon.com for shash a g o s t i n h o get involved in the today don't delay and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care and peace